So I loved your Instagram. And then Fred wrote a post about what you said, because I oh. wrote a post about what you said. Oh, that's and so sweet. the being present, like oh, we're, in the we're, moment. We're talking about banana bread. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as silly as it is, it's like, you're like, okay, well, if it takes me another 20 minutes to finish this right, it doesn't make any difference. I have to say, I have never, um, until now, felt like I have endless time to, to cook, right? I've felt like I better do it quickly, I better do it efficiently, and efficiently meant I better cook and be on my computer and be on my phone at the same time, which turns out that's deeply inefficient and causes lots of mistakes. And so I've learned about the inefficiency of distraction multitasking. and multitasking <laughs> and multitask I'm actually I cannot multitask ever and the idea that I think I could do it with cooking is even more illogical um so it has been nice to cook and feel like it's gonna be what it is and the end usually I cook I like wash my you know everybody eats fantastic and afterwards I'm like you guys, the dishes are all yours. But now, you know, somebody might have something more important to do than I do, and I can do dishes. Like it's, there's something very collaborative about having endless time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, believe it or not, I uh, bought a crochet kit. And oh. when I was a kid, I know. When I was a kid, I used to make all this stuff. And it was almost like I wanted, knowing what I was like back then, I was literally just training myself because I never loved school. I, I was always a self-educator. So I learned how to knit, crochet. I mean, all of those things. And, um, but I always raced through them because that's my personality. And if it was a mistake, I was like, oh, whatever. But now I'm like, I might as well get this right. That's like, amazing. And that is a huge game-changing thing. I think one of the questions I ask myself, and I wonder if you do as well, is it's, my game changing in that zone is I've been drawing every day. I don't know how to draw um, at all. I've never drawn. I've never been drawn to drawing. Um, I was considering knitting. I was considering crocheting, but drawing is just the thing that took hold. And I have very low commitment. It's like, just do one a day. Will I do one a day when this all eases? Do you have a sense? Like, do you, are you in it? for the long term? Does it not matter because you're in it right now? Like, how are you thinking about that? Well, that's a very good question. And I know we've talked about age, right? Mm -hmm. So we're in our next career. Totally. You know, and we've always worked. And so, you know, you think about things that you probably thought to yourself, well, what is it I want to do? What is it what I do when I have this time, this time, this time? And I was always under the assumption that I wanted to take classes. Like I'll take an art history class. I'll take this class. And right now I could do that. And I'm like, I don't want to take a class. So I mean, that's, that's the same thing, of course, because we have these similar feelings. I'm like, well, maybe I will like fill in the blank, take a class. I'm like, yeah, not, not really. I'd rather do something I don't know how to do and just do it. Right. And so that's how you think. And so those visions of what we all think about, you know, when I grow up or when I sold my company or when I, you know, I'm home with the kids, whatever it may be. And so I'm going back to this craft. And my daughter asked me, um, our oldest daughter, Jessica said, what is it of all the things you've done all these years that you've just loved the most? Mm -hmm. And um, that was a great question. And what was the answer? Well, the truth is, the answer is, I will say is, you know, simple, maybe as it is, is like, I love being a, ma a mother. I love being a parent. I love being a mother. Um, that is something that has been so important to me my whole life and, um, and continues to be very important, the importance of the relationships with my children and my family. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> so I need something else. So what, Although you are in, crochet. <laughs> like you're incredibly close to your, your kids. And I mean, it just shows how, you know, momming goes on forever. For life. For, For life. life. It is what do you think will happen afterwards? I couldn't agree more. Some people describe it 
as going through a war and things are different on the other side of the war. But there's so many more forces at there's so many forces at work. I don't want to say more forces at work, but you know, what will, how will technology and isolation and liberation through technology, how will that change all of us? I mean, you're now in a location separate from your kids connected by technology, but that's not connection at all. Like my one thing I think about is how, when it begins again, do we, revalue being together because you have to overcome the fear and then you have to overcome the most recent practice and the practice is to be separate yeah i mean i think there will be a slow entry yeah but i you know i wonder i mean the last couple of years you know both fred and i have felt that everything has been so fluff and so um, anxiety ridden. Um, and of course that comes from, you know, our moron in chief and, um, you know, and, and, and we're like, this has got to stop. Like this has to end somewhere. Yeah. You know, I'm not a religious person, but certainly what's happened, it, it had to end. And I wonder is now people are not on that crazy um, gerbil, you know, hamster wheel. Are they, going to return to that? Or are they going to have more of this connection to like old ways, you know, which we're starting to begin with the millennials, you know, being thoughtful about our environment, being thoughtful about food waste, you know, making sure your shoes get redone, not buying a bunch of junk that you're going to throw out, like all those things that was very similar to hundreds of years ago. Right. Well, one can hope we continue in in that direction, right? Some some version of back to the land. I went and bought, um, you know, pea shoots and uh, and lettuce starts and beets, and I'm like, I want to have some control, right? Because my uh, local stores have bare shelves right now. I mean, I think it's such an interesting time to think about independence, which you know, hundreds of years ago, independence was prized and essential, like we had no choice. Yeah, and the farmers, I mean, what do you plant when you don't know where your chain, your supply chain is? Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, in talking about the industry that we both love and know so well, I mean, what will the result be for restaurants? Talking about a slow entry, how does a restaurant prepare for a slow re-entry? How do you make money at 50% fewer people in your restaurant? Right. Assuming that they either have a fear of coming in or if you have to take out 50 percent of your seats right before we talk about that because i definitely want to talk about that when you said how we're going to use technology and we're going to use technology is eventually everyone is going to have something on their phone that will tell you um if in fact that you are um you've had the virus or not had the yeah. virus and then you will go with people and you'll like literally like, you know, you'll see, okay, all eight of us were together. Um, and then you'll find out like, well, we got sick. And then you'll know that and they'll, you know, push that at you. I mean, so, you know, will that happen when we walk in a restaurant? You know, they're going to be like, okay, we just need to see your app to ensure that you're healthy um, before you can come in. And um, I mean, these poor restaurants, I mean, I think what's different than the war is nobody knew what the economy was. Right. We knew we had an economy. No one can afford to pay each other now. Right. And it all starts with the banks. You know, when you go to restaurants, it's like all these asshole, you know, landlords that took yeah. out huge mortgages and especially ex pretended that this restaurant owner was going to service their mortgage. So that's, you know, the beginnings. I think that's but, totally right. And I'm not sure that everyone understands that. I mean, that it, that's exactly where it begins. It begins with the mortgage. It begins with the landlord. Um, and that's part of the reasons that restaurants are just in such a tourniquet. Right. So like that one guy in Brooklyn who owned 18 apartment buildings and said, everyone rent free. My guess is he owns those free and clear. Right. <laughs> For sure. Right? So he's like, you know, I've made plenty of money. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. I can, I can afford to do this. Yeah. Right? But not if you have Chase knocking on your door. Certainly so, not. I, you know, I, I really, 
I think that everyone in the restaurant industry is waiting to go back and get paid, but we don't, you can't just go back. No, I've been talking to people about what, what does reentry look like? You know, what is that plan? How do you plan for it? And um, not only do you not just go back like that, but your customer doesn't come back like that. Your supply chain doesn't come back like that. You need to have money in order to pay your suppliers who you haven't paid. I mean, it's very it's complex. Multiple. And do you think that restaurants will change in regards to their community? So, you know, you look at the supply chain of grocery stores since 1950s, which is, was so in dire need of massive change, right? And now we're seeing this direct to consumer from the farmer, even from Baldor, right? For sure. Right. You're able to order from the people that are giving their supply chain to restaurants and so does that well, to be fair as you and i know like that's not a great model for them right i mean it's terrible for it's great that baldor is doing it it's great because they continue to support the people from whom they get food and they help support people who want to buy food but right. their customer is selling sixteen thousand pounds of something to totally for people. Like, I don't know that Baldor, I don't know that those people stay in business in this new economy. Well, if their website continues how it is, they're definitely not staying in business. <laughs> it is a painful process. Um, but, you know, you think about Europe, although they've got their own set of issues, Europe never really got into that 19 that that food supply chain that we do right small refrigerators new food and um every day will we see more restaurants collaborate only with their farmers and create small pickups for what is happening now small local food carbon footprint um, and changing how we get food. I mean, I remember having milk delivered to us in the back, on the back porch. I know, know twice a week. Great glass bottles. Uh, <laughs> I I think that restaurants are going to have to rethink every piece of their model if they become part liquor store. If the liquor, if the tide laws change. Yeah. Um, if they other uh, states already have them. What's that? Other states already have them, like LA, right? Like in a, California, in a Whole Foods, you can buy a jug of Tito's. It works out really well. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly so, right now. Yes. Um, but I just think that they'll, you know, we had already moved in so many of these directions, right? But it, uh, which is to say a direction where a restaurant has multiple revenue streams. It's not just the butts in the seats, it's the t-shirts, it's the books, it's the events, it's the, um, it's all these things together. It's the longer hours, it's the fewer staff, it's the tighter menu. Uh, what concerns me about that is how personality comes through and how the experience that we all, you know, cherish, which is so personal, like what happens to that if we're really reduced because of actually making a business that works better, um, the menus change, the menus homogenize, uh, and the offerings homogenize as well. Well, we want to think about what happened prior to this, you know, prior and post, which is there was this, such a separation of elitism in this country. You know, we were seeing all these private clubs start, right? Which was insane. But if you go back a couple hundred years ago, that's just how life worked. And if you're going to go to a restaurant where you are trusting the people that are in it and they want to be able to make money, are we going to see some more of that kind of stuff? I think the idea of the membership restaurant, uh, not an elitist version, right? Yes, um, absolutely. It's, it would be a different version of a CSA. Like, how is a restaurant going to stay afloat? So if you buy a subscription, it's like a subscription to the opera, right? right? You buy your subscription, you have a seat every week um, or whatever it turns out to be. I mean, that would, it's an interesting and odd model, but if it's about community building and about this connection of people who you 
um, feel safe with and connected to and share your values, which makes this world, our world's more insular, which I think is not necessarily the best, but it's something to think about, right? Like not at the elitist level, but in the community level. I, I think that something that I see and I'm thinking about is how do we build community now? I have this crazy idea, <laughs> um, which is taking a single pot. So I'm in upstate New York right now mm -hmm. and um, I'm cooking a ton and I would love for someone to just drop something on my porch you know, and be like, I got you covered. Yeah. <laughs> you do not have to cook dinner tonight. And I just have this notion of creating a community through a, a single pot, right? Like drop off, you know, um, a pot of vegetables on the porch for someone and they take that pot and then they cook vegetables. And this notion of creating, I mean, it's odd, but it, and it's this moment of community through food. And yeah. what is the that? Casserole. Exactly. What is that community going forward where we really take care of one another, which I think is the, would be the most incredible thing to come out of this is a heightened sense of how interconnected we all are. And um, I don't want to say how little we each need, but what I've heard from so many people I talk to is concern about their neighbor, concern about safety, concern about the, the future in a bigger picture way, and very little complaining anxiety about like what am I going to do when this is over which I think yeah. is fascinating like I would have assumed that the real focus would be on okay what am I going to do how am I going right. to be employed who's going to pay me and I haven't that's not been the what I've heard what about you no. it's more about the moment yeah you know and I think one of the greatest things is that you know, every day someone new comes into my head, right? That mm -hmm. I, someone asked me about someone today, what, who would they recommend I speak to? And I was like, oh, well, you should speak to this person. I was like, oh, wonder how they are. Yeah. You know, and so I'm having these running conversations, you know, through my phone, sometimes on FaceTime, sometimes not with people that are, you know, my first tier in my life. Yeah. And that actually feels really nice because when I was running at full speed, I didn't take the time out to be present with them. No different than, you know, making a banana cake, right? You were multitasking as you were talking to them or you would right. just have a meal with them. And now I feel like I want to see them more on my daily life. Yeah. I, I mean, I have um, some regular... FaceTime dates with with friends really checking in because you want to be yeah. sure, particularly if people are living on their own, um, are they is is it really okay? You know? Yeah. And yeah, I feel like I put this in the bucket of wow, I, I would love to hold on to this. You know, yeah. this notion of a connected check-in. Right. I mean, this is gonna go on for a lot longer than anyone thinks about or want to think about um and we're seeing such a shift in our society um and also realizing how globally collect connected we are um and um and uh and even for the food world when i think about the government so i watched this great uh documentary which i highly recommend everyone watches called um crip camp which was um, came out at Sundance, and it's about the uh, community of um, um, disabled people. And there was this camp in the '60s. Oh, I saw was, I saw a trailer for this. It looked amazing. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And there was this camp in the '60s, and this one woman, Judy, became the leader. But over time, you know, they would see each other at these events. And when everything shifted, you know, into the 60s and the 70s with the Vietnam War, this group of people at camp became the voice for all of these people. And that is why we have the laws in place today when it comes to building a building and, you know, being thoughtful about people that have disabilities and disabilities are so great. And you see, um, I hate to say it, but 
all the Republicans through this is just like, why do we care about these people? It's such a small amount of people. Why, why would we spend that money, right? And how long it took for them to get through government. And, you know, I keep thinking about David Chang as he's like tweeting out to the government. And I think he should be the voice and the lobbyist, which mm -hmm. is the way our country works is if you don't have a voice for a community, you mm -hmm. don't get what you want in government. And the food community is so separated by state. Like I know Liz Newmark is involved in that in New York state, but that's not involved federally. Right. I mean, I feel like I've gotten um, a tremendous education in politics during this time because I'm working at the state level, creating this organization called ROAR, which is a uh, relief, um, I wrote the name, and every time I still trip over it. Um, <laughs> relief opportunities for all restaurants. Oh, Roar. Very cool. Yeah, and um, Roar is trying to help advocacy at the state level, and uh, we have a relief fund for New York City workers. But understanding what happens at the federal level and state very different things. We're working yeah. with independent restaurants that have never had a voice. And it's sort of extraordinary to think of, right? There are um, institutions that are lobbyists for restaurants in New York State, but it's every kind of restaurant. And every kind of restaurant has a different, um, a different need and a different population and a different ownership structure. And we're talking about the independent restaurants. Um, we're sort of cousins to the IRC, which uh, Tom Clickio founded, which is Independent Restaurant Coalition. And they're working at the national level. Um, and in both cases, we're trying to influence bills that are under consideration right now that directly affect the ability of uh, restaurants to come back and the ability to pay workers. And um, I, as a generally non-political person, I'm like, ah, I get it. And now I really get it at, at such a level. It took this to see up close, like the bill that's in the state Senate today can either doom us or save us. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obvious, I, I would assume that large, like, you know, Pizza Hut or McDonald's, no they're not very obvious, right? I mean, I even remember the beginning days of the internet in the mid 90s. And we would be invited, this group of people, because there weren't a lot of us that really did yeah. care about politics, to yeah. these very intimate gatherings with senators. And, you know, they would say, you guys should come down to Washington and talk to our committee. And I'm like, I remember thinking, you don't understand. We don't want to talk to committees. This is why we're building this thing. You know? <laughs> like, get on, talk to your constituencies. Like, yeah. this is a platform. So the internet has changed that ability. But on the other hand, you know, our country is built in a way like a company. And if you want your share, you got to speak out. Yeah. And, um, and, and the mom and pops, which I would consider the small restaurants, are the foundation of this economy, but they don't have a voice in the political system. The, I mean, the numbers are staggering, right? There's something like 15.6 million um, restaurant workers, and that's astonishing. But what's even more astonishing and more excruciating when you think of the dismantling of that restaurant, independent restaurant system, is the supply chain, right? So there's tens of millions of more people who are affected, like the florist, the ceramist, the you know, the cleaning yeah. crews, um, and then the you know the lawyers, the real estate brokers. Oh, like the lawyers are going to make out like I know, I'm like well, I'm not worried about them, <laughs> but <they're, laughs> but, um, but all of the other people who uh, you know who who support who are part of the artisan network that help restaurants uh, thrive and grow. I mean tens of millions of people yeah. just in restaurants. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they get flowers delivered to them a couple times a week. And right. most of them are independent contractors. Exactly. You know, people that come in clean. Um, you know, I mean, all of these people, and a lot of them don't have health care. You know, they're just living hand to mouth. And I've always been, I have a couple friends over the years 
who have, when they were in their 20s, they were happy to live hand to mouth. Yeah. And actually a lot of them now are in their 50s and they're always been like, that's kind of who they are. Uh -huh. And I give them a lot of credit. Like they've managed to, you know, have a family, have the life they want to have. They don't have much in the savings account. They've done things that they love, you know, and we're seeing millennials are going to do that too. Yeah. Um, but now here they are at an age where that's really scary. I, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because I wonder with the growth of the gig economy, which is what we're talking about here, right? In part, you're a florist because you love to do flowers and you're a ceramist because you love to do pots and, you know, you do a little bit of artwork and then you do a little bit of PR on the side and like PR pays your bills. Are we going to see a change in that? And everyone's like, I want a 401k. I want to work for a business. I mean, talking to my daughter, who's a, um, a sophomore in college, she's like, mom, we all want those jobs. The economy just doesn't have those jobs for us. Yeah. Like, well, what do you think? You know, Albert Wanger, Fred's partner, has been talking about universal health care and universal income for a decade. Wow. You know, and the only place I can look to to sort of understand that is Britain. Right? Because there is universal health care. Right. Or the Nordic, the Nordic countries seem to do. Yes, yes. But also in Britain, you know, there's almost universal income, right? Uh -huh. So when you, you know, when you graduate from college, they pay for you to go to grad school. They give you a stipend to do whatever you want in your life for a couple of years. You know, no one is going to go hungry or homeless. They uh -huh. have support systems for that. Um, and we as a country, a very wealthy country have ignored that. I mean, you come to LA and it is heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, they, they have interesting enough gotten the majority of the homeless off the street when this thing happened, they put them mm -hmm. in these parking lots in these vans that they own themselves. And I mm -hmm. think they're providing for them, but what happens when this is over? Do they just let out the gate, you know, mm -hmm. and the people that are on the streets now are so mentally deranged. Yeah. And scary yeah. and I think god you know how can we allow this I don't believe that everyone people choose to live on the streets um and there's been plenty of studies around I mean in New Orleans after Katrina they had a huge homeless population and they turned that around even to yeah. the people that were like you know but it is it takes money which is a social system yep. um you know opportunities um, working with their kids. I mean, it takes a lot of people to focus on one human being, but if someone did the data, they'd find out the amount of money that was spent in the end is less than the street and taking the hospital and putting them in jail and taking them out and all the different things that we do. But that is very forthright for anyone to think 10 years because our politicians just think about how do I stay in office now? For sure. And, and what do, you know, depending on who your constituents are, what do my constituents believe? Yes. And, well, and that, that's a good yeah. question based on what's going on. Do my yeah. constituents actually believe that we should all be going to vote in Wisconsin when there is a, a coronavirus? <laughs> just astonishing. 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 So what do you think about, you know, that the killer app, I mean, of Instagram and watching all of these people take hold. I mean, we're hanging out with Christine Dosi, watching her bake every day. And Chang is like, you know, cooking for Hugo and the family. I know. <laughs> it's watching, kind of watching Dave, you know, uh, and the microwave is a highlight of my day. I mean, it just cracks me up. Um, and he's so, he's so real. You know, the thing that, I've been thinking about looking at Instagram, looking at, at chefs turn into home cooks, which at Food and Wine for 20 years, like that's, we tried to turn chefs and have the mind yeah. of a home cook in order to create recipes that people could cook and it was impossible. So it's fast. And then none of them are ever at home, hadn't ever been at home, which is why it was so hard for them. Now just watching like Eric Repair is, um, oh yeah, favorite. like I love Eric's food, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Dave's food's fantastic. So, but what I think about is what about the food that they were doing? Like, 
is there some kind of shame in showing beauty, in showing expensive food, in showing like where we, <laughs> what's that? Tweezer food? Tweezer food. I mean, is there some shame in that? Like, or is it that we're, is it not really about shame, but it's more that they're reflecting their lives. Like what we've been interested with chefs for the last two decades is knowing like, what is their life really like? You know, mm -hmm. they, they became our icons because they inspired us um, and they entertained us. And we wanted to have in on their world, whether it was like through, you know, Tony Bourdain and travel um, or a chef like getting behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so now behind the scenes is in people's houses. And I think like we're so ready to go on that journey sure. when we are well, going on that journey. Food will change. Clothing will change. I mean, masks are hot. It's going to be a big fashion <laughs> item. You know, I mean, the fashion industry will change. You know, are people going to just dress more, ca more casual than they ever have before? Are they going to be just craving going to a restaurant where it's a family style spaghetti and meatballs? I mean, I can hardly wait. I mean, the restaurant experience wasn't only seeing what the chef could offer, but it was also hearing the chatter in the room, seeing the people in the restaurant, the vibe that you felt, the hospitality that was given to you. Like, I can hardly wait to go somewhere and someone comes over and says, can we get, you know, what would you like to drink this evening? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I also feel like to me, the great thing about, I mean, one of the many great things about restaurants is all those things you just said, but it's also the introduction to other cultures, yes. right? Like just, you know, being inside a Thai culture, or Sri Lankan culture, or I mean, something that is not mine and being welcomed into that world. Um, I can't it's wait amazing. to come back. Well, we're spoiled living in New York, right? Or even here I am in LA, which is every night now I'm cooking, right? Which I certainly did when the kids were young, except one or two nights a week. And they were beyond excited to order in Chinese. Like that was a big, <laughs> exciting event. Um, but, you know, everything was different. I could go out for Thai. I could go out for pizza. I could go out for French. I could go out for whatever I wanted. And now in my home, as I'm trying to create something different every day. Me too, every day. It, every day, because that's how I live my life. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I've sort of, um, it's not rigid or regimented, but there's Chinese night, there's Thai night, there's <laughs> French. There's American, there's one night of, um, there's a place near us called The Lantern. They do great pizza. I'm like, oh, it's pizza night tomorrow. You know, <laughs> it's, um, and I, I just want to keep going through the flavors. And I think, right. wow, it would be amazing to be either the person or the family that's like, I'm just really happy to have pasta and a salad every night. Like that's not happening. It's not, it's not the way my brain works. Like that, yeah. That would, yeah. Yeah. Well, you think about, the one thing that has come out of this, there are always silver linings, but when we think about the food industry and all this chatter around it, the one thing that has scared the shit out of everyone is how am I get my food? Yeah. Not necessarily how do I go to a restaurant, but how do I get my food? How am I safe from my boxes? Should I order from a CSA? When I go to the grocery store, I have to wear a mask and I have to wear gloves and then I have to clean down when it's gone and people are going crazy and buying tons of shit. And so you cannot not think about food. Yes, that's right? true. It's our, it, you know, and if you, you, you've run out of cash and you're in big trouble, there's these food pantries that are overwhelmed. Yeah. And so for anyone in the government, even though we certainly need someone to represent all of these individual owners is that what everyone has top of mind is really simple stuff. Yeah. Food, medicine, toilet paper, toilet paper, of course. But these are things that people are thinking about on a daily basis. Not so much about, yeah, I need to talk to my friends. Yes. I have to do my work. Um, you know, um, I don't commute two hours a day. So I, you know, people are home now with their children or a project, you know, you're drawing, which is so cool. And, um, but the food, it's food. Food is what we need. Um, I'd like to know what you think 
are the new startups that will come out of this? And what are you thinking about startups? Because you've invested in so many, like, is this going to crush the ones that existed? It, I'm sure it's very case by case. And what will grow out of this? Like what, you know, ashes are very regenerative for the soil. So like what, what will sprout? You know, it's kind of interesting to see the companies that were, I always thought were overvalued and made no sense to me, uh -huh. um, you know, um, particularly in the CPG space, right? So, you know, luggage or, um, um, you know, certain food products or um, um, that kind of stuff, right? So I think that they will, um, if they're smart, they will cut the burn rate immediately and uh -huh. think about other products that they can make because they have either cash in the bank yeah. or, um, and whatever it is, if they're really good entrepreneurs will say, you know what, I got 8 million bucks in the bank yeah. and um, we're going to sit on it while we yeah. sit in our, in our office and hunker down after firing 75% of the staff yeah. and thinking about what are we going to do smart with this because I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. I think others that I never believed in, like a blue apron, I yeah. never got it. Yeah. I mean, Amazing. Yeah. Right. So here we go. Um, so, so some companies where they were doing good are now just exploding like Porter Road, Butcher. Oh my yep. God. I mean, he literally just hired 13 people in the past week. Wow. Because he, the supply, he's literally getting 250 new customers a day. Oh my goodness. Right. So it's, he's exploding. Right. So that's a good thing. Right. Yeah. So I, I think we will see a lot of this, the startup generation, which was essentially the last decade and a half. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely shift to the cream will rise to the top. Uh -huh. Really good people will come up with fabulous ideas yeah. to, to fill voids that are going to need in the future. Uh -huh. Where do you see um, those goods? Well, you know, I see companies like drone base is like, yeah. boom, right. I mean, it makes total sense. You know, you don't need a person. You need a person right here and they do drones and, you know, <laughs> um, you know, that'll be great. You'll see, you'll see companies like the mighty, which is all about helping people with, you know, um, mental health care or sickness in communities like that will ex is exploding, right? They can't even, they're just blown away by what's coming in, you mm -hmm. know? I, and I think someone like parachute, which is, you know, towels and robes and sheets, people are going to want things in their home. They're going to want to have, you know, more of that comfort. Mm -hmm. So I think some of them will just, it'll be over. Yeah. Um, and others will die. And um, I think a lot of this replication of the same shit that's out there in 19 different ways that keeps coming into my box will cease. Um, you uh, what, know? Are the, what are the things that you're seeing that are like most replicated that are in your box? I mean, you know, it used to be just like anything from, you know, a granola bar to, you know, a new dating app. You know, I mean, yeah. I talked to... I guess it was a week and a half, couple of weeks ago to a tech stars group, 350 people across the globe, which was so cool because this is a global pandemic. Yeah. And I, you know, I said, if you have not raised money yet ever, unless you have something that you are so sure of, not only as a founder, or this is a second, third, fourth entrepreneur that, you know, you can't do anything else, figure out how to survive for 18 to 24 months. Yeah. But if you have another granola bar, yeah, pack it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, you know, what do you think? Um, what do you think will happen with the, um, the beyond meats of the world and impossible burgers? Like, do you think that it's their time to shine or clearly my hope, um, you know, is it like, it's not real? I think it will continue to shine. I think yeah. that supplies of food and, you know, I, I think the millennials have it right. And certainly generation Z in regards to rethinking what we're putting into our bodies. Yeah. You know, and that goes from pharma <laughs> to um, meat. And I don't think there's anything wrong with eating meat, but you know, growing up eating meat all the time, 
I don't, even want, I don't want it all the time anymore. Yeah. It's funny because before, so about the month, a month before the pandemic, I had just crossed over to say, you know, I'm actually going to be mostly, mostly vegetables. I'll have a little meat, but I'm really going to put it to the side. I'm not going to be um, militant about it. And as soon as, you know, pandemic hits and I'm feeding people like three meals a day, seven days a week, I'm like, I love meat. I mean, you know, it's all, it's all throw a steak on the barbecue. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's all local. I know the farmer who grew whatever it is, so I'm not supporting industrial farming, which to me is the biggest issue with them. I agree. Meat, but, and, and this way I do feel like I'm supporting my community, which is another value I hold hold dear, but I'm like, sure. I am like, I'm really, I'm, I'm good with that hamburger. Um, you know, the local sausage, it's all, it's all, but, but it, I wonder if that mirrors anyone else, this idea of balance and nourishment to me, that type of proteins, part of it, it just makes my, it makes me feel, um, sort of cozier in the same way you're talking about robes and towels, a sausage, that, <laughs> that's what a sausage is to me. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 there is something about this intimacy even though we can't leave our homes right right so you know i had a friend who um uh her good friend lost her husband through this it wasn't oh. COVID, but he he had he'd been sick and so um uh they had a funeral just for i think so everyone could mourn him they knew this was happening 350 people on Zoom, a rabbi, a cantor, the whole thing. And she said, it was actually, I felt so connected in this mm -hmm. very strange way. Mm -hmm. I mean, here I am in my living room, you know, with my husband, and mm -hmm. we are connecting through this computer, and there was something incredible about it. And so there's, I keep thinking about that because... Mm -hmm. There is something about the world that we came from, which mm -hmm. was this hyper focused, connected, running at 400 miles an hour, climbing every mountain, you know, trying to make ends meet in other parts of the country. Um, and now we're home. Mm -hmm. And it just re shifts mm -hmm. everyone's thoughts of, you know, it's like a diet one day at a time yeah yeah no, no one's um, looking forward right because this has become the new norm right i mean everyone did zoom on passover i know i mean uh, what a concept or i a know funeral, you know or whatever it be. zoom graduation with zoom graduation with five thousand people i mean it's it would have been inconceivable you know what will happen with all that online dating if we're going to see a shift to more marriages and more connections and more understanding of individuals because you know we're all living under one hut right now and you got to work together and you got to pick your shots yeah it you know before um like bc before covid i ha had <laughs> launched a women in conversation series getting uh, yes. creative women right together and um 12 people to connect and easily that goes online but I'm thinking, what is lost? You know, what are we losing that we need to remember, that we need to sort of write down and come back to and say, actually, we do need to, you know, be able to touch. We do need to be able to, not inappropriately, but we need to have that type of Human being in the same place. Yeah. Disintermediated, um, yeah. not with technology. And I think it's going to be, because of the switch, it'll be harder, but more valuable, as long as we remember to value it. Well, I don't know. It will be interesting. We should have this conversation again in six months. Wouldn't that, I mean, I think it'd actually be fascinating. So we should leave with our, our set of predictions yes. and, and revisit them. Okay, I'm, so your predictions. Give me how many? I mean, maybe just three. I'm interested in fear because I actually think there'll be less, I think that fear will be conquered. I what kind think, of fear? I think people will take precautions, but overcome 
their fear of small gatherings. I mean, I think that they might still have, right? Um, There'll be PTSD, but yes. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that the isolation, if it's broken, you know, if, if we're not isolated, that we'll overcome our fear to spend time as you just did in socially distant, respectable groups. Um, I think that the restaurant industry will be uh, transformed. And I think that when people come back, they will not come back as we knew them. So whatever that means, right? It means uh, doing three things in one restaurant. I think that the coalition that's emerged among independents will strengthen and the potential for figuring out, it would just be the beginning days of it, but figure out combined buying, combined marketing, combined among disparate groups will emerge because as independents, they will fail. So I, I feel like there'll be a, that kind of change in the restaurant world. And I, um, and I think that this is a hope, not a think, so we'll see. Um, I, I hope that this notion of being present and the value we found from being present will remain with us so that I know so many people whose lives today, right now, during this pandemic, are more balanced and better than they ever have been, even accounting for their anxiety, fear, global, you know, like from all the way to, from global to family. Will I have a job to what, you know, what kids will be born, like all of that, their balance in their life feels better. Yeah. And so my hope is that that will be nurtured and we will all be able to nurture it within each other to support the choice to, um, to not get back on the treadmill in the same way. Okay, fair enough. Um, my what about you? I totally agree with you on the food supply. I think restaurants will return in a very different way. The food chain supply will change in a different way. Um, and by the way, needed to change for a long, long time. Um, um, just like, um, and we will see uh, less garbage in products like grocery stores with 5,000 items on the shelf, right? We will yeah. be paring down dramatically and being smart about it. And there will be more connection of community through local restaurants. Um, yeah, I totally like believe that. Fine. I, and, and they will rethink themselves. I agree. Um, the second thing is I, I believe retail will change. It has to change. It was meant to change. Um, ready to change. I think we'll see a lot of these malls that are losing uh, the big department stores start thinking about housing uh -huh. and um, rethinking about building towns with inside them. Wow. Um, if, you know, if they are supporting um, middle income housing, um, perhaps there is, or even, you know, homeless situations, there will be one little store where there are social workers, you know. Yeah. And that um, there's and, and that creates a better um, community where you have everything from you know top to bottom, right? So yeah. I, I think that will happen. Um, and um, I want to believe that this shift will make people more present and more thoughtful about the decisions they make in their lives. Yeah. Um, and we will see a variety of new things happen through technology that um, allows us to have all those things, mm -hmm. right? There will be an underlying layer of all these things that are built on top of technology. Uh-huh. And sure. that's the, my three. Although my fourth is, and God, I freaking hope so, is that these schmucks in the White House will be out of office and then the whole Trump family goes to freaking jail because they are, are such thugs. And, you know, Joe Biden, although maybe not our best choice, becomes the president because there is something 
whether you like him or not, there is something very authentic um, and caring about him, you know? Um, and I think we need someone who really fundamentally at his core yeah. cares about us and can make us feel like grandpa is loving us. You know, we need that back. We need to go back to a place where there wasn't this anger and animosity and division that is forced upon us um, that um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not pretty and there's no reason to behave that way. Um, I hope number four, you know, comes true. I think that, you know, I've seen Trump's ratings in the polls have gone up. I find it astonishing. Makes me feel um, disconnected from the country. Yeah. Anyway, I just, it's, uh, I, I agree it's, with you on, uh, yeah. let's get, let's get behind Biden. Um, well, it was really fun to talk to you. It was so great. Um, uh, really great. And so, yes, let's do this again in six months. Let's. I love it. Absolutely. And um, be safe up there. <laughs> yeah, you too. And uh, I'll, I'll talk to you, you know, by text. And sure. uh, see you in the Hamptons. See you in the Hamptons. <laughs> Bye. Right. See you later. Bye.